Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 288, featuring the first part of a brand new interview series with Paul Newrath of Other Side Entertainment. Now, Paul, as you may know, was the founder of Blue Sky and Looking Glass Studios, some of the companies uh, responsible for some of the best role-playing games, at least some of my uh, personal favorites, including Ultima Underworld 1 and 2. Now, as you also probably know, he uh, did a, they launched a Kickstarter to fund a spiritual successor to the Underworld series. They had always planned to make a third game, but uh, for whatever reason, didn't get to it, <laughs> couldn't do it until now. Uh, the spiritual successor is called Underworld Ascendant, and it was successfully funded just a short while ago. So I wanted to have Paul on uh, to talk about the uh, talk about that project and also what's uh, the progress they're made on it and their ideas for the future. Anyway, a lot of great stuff in this uh, first segment. So without further ado, here is Mr. Paul Newrath. All right, folks, I am here with Paul Newrath, who I don't think it's an ex ex exaggeration at all to call this guy a living legend among game developers. His resume goes all the way back to some of the uh, very early days of the video games industry. He's founded a lot of companies. Uh, Other Side Entertainment is his most recent one. They're working on Ultima Ascendant, of course. Uh, before that, he was uh, he founded Blue Sky Productions, which changed their name to uh, later changed the name to Looking Glass Studios, and also he's uh, the founder of Floodgate Entertainment. He's worked on lots of games we've talked about on this show before, and I'm sure you're familiar with including Auto Duel, System Shock 2, Thief, and, of course, Ultima Underworld. How are you today, Paul? Mm, pretty good. Uh, first off, I wanted to congratulate you on your Kickstarter success uh, for Ultima Ascendant. Uh, you had asked for $600,000, $600, ended up with $860,356. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, I got the, uh, the box copy headed my way, hopefully, uh, soon, right? <laughs> however long it takes, though, take your time. Uh, but first off, I'm kind of wondering about this result. I mean, uh, were you, are you pleased with this result? Uh, you know, was it more or less? Did it surprise you? You know, kind of what were your, what are your feelings on it at this point? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think what we, you know, what what pleased us the most was the fan reaction. Just hearing from all these people who played, many who played the original Underworld. And we're, you know, really looking forward to seeing where we could take the franchise. And just hearing the passion in the fans' voices, the backers' voices, and uh, their participation in the in the campaign was, uh, uh, that was great. Great to see. Great to see that we weren't, you know, the only ones who were excited to try to bring it back. I love other people with us. Yeah, there's a great deal of excitement. Now, it's my understanding, if for folks out there that haven't pledged, or maybe they pledged already, uh, but didn't, uh, you know, they still want to say a T-shirt or something like that. It's still possible to pledge on the directly on the website with PayPal? Uh, yes, and we actually just expanded uh, two days ago. Uh, we now have credit cards we accept, too. So we're continuing to crowdsource fund, uh, and we'll probably do so to, until around the end of this so year. So for folks that want that T-shirt, I think I saw that was uh, $25. Is that what that's a that's limited right. supply or can there, what's the deal with those t-shirts? Well, we're doing one that is unique for Kickstarters that has, uh, uh, has a unique look to it. And then we're going to do a different one, uh, same $25, but a different one for, uh, uh, post Kickstarter. You know, it's important that the people who, who stepped up in the first 30 days during Kickstarter get some, you know, exclusive things that are for them. So with these extra funds that are coming in, is that are you still working towards the stretch goals or is this a different set of goals? Uh, so, yes, we currently we had announced stretch goals that went beyond uh, the funding that we did in Kickstarter. So we're maintaining those stretch goals. We'll see, you know, which ones we get to over the you know, balance of the year. More I'm really less. hoping you can hit the one for the co-op. You know, I think it's one point <laughs> fifteen million. I, hope so just, too. I was really pleased with that. I thought that was a great idea, you know, especially since you've got the, you know, people that got the box copy get the digital copy too, so it'd be perfect, right? They can send that to their friend and and co-op with their buddies. So I really hope that'll, right. uh, that'll that'll right. happen. Uh, well, what's the? I guess it's been 
I'm not really actually how long has it been since the Kickstarter? I didn't write this down, but has there been any news or any big developments? Uh, it's kind of early, I, I know, but um, <laughs> how's it going? Everything going according to plan? Well, nothing goes according to plan. That would be the only thing that's known is that there'll be surprises and things won't go exactly according to plan. It wouldn't be software development if they did. But no, I mean, we're, it's only been uh, a little over a month. It's been a month and uh, and a day, I guess, uh, since the Kickstarter ended. So, um, you know, we, a lot of what we've been doing uh, is just really starting to shift from pre-production towards production. So, you know, a lot of the work we did in the Kickstarter was really, uh, you know, concept work and prototype work. Uh, you learn a lot from that, but then you have to make the shift over to production. You're actually building, you know, the real stuff. I wish I could have been there when you finally clinched that that goal for the first time. Must have been a very good feeling to know you'd made it. It, it was. It was. Uh, there was a little bit of. Uh, uh, you know, finger nail biting uh, before we reach the six hundred thousand dollars because that we we were more than uh, halfway through the campaign when we reached the six hundred thousand dollar funding. Uh, but once we did, it, it was great, uh, and you know, we got into the stretch goals, and then it was nice. We made a really nice push the, the final days. The fans really really responded well. Now, it's going back through your updates. I noticed you gave a lot of shout outs all throughout the campaign to other Kickstarters. You know, it seems like, I don't know if you've been keeping up with some of the recent Kickstarters, uh, Seven Dragon Saga, uh, that was when I was really behind, and it uh, unfortunately didn't make. Uh, there's one, Dungeons mm -hmm. of Aladorn. Are you familiar with that, familiar with that one? Um, <laughs> there's a bunch, you know, but it's that one's kind of frustrating because it's yeah. so close. It's got like three days, and it just, you know, it's getting really close. Of course, the Black Glove, yeah. you know, some of the Bioshock guys, the... Uh, uh, I don't know if you'd be familiar with that one or not, but uh, I am. I, ba I backed that one personally, and some of my, my friends worked uh, were on that one. Um, it's it's harder to kickstart crowdfund games today than it was a couple years ago. Um, you know, in the early days when, when crowdsource funding was really brand new and exciting, uh, like back when Brian Fargo was doing Wasteland Two and some of those early or, or Star Citizen. Uh, there were a lot more people paying attention to crowdsource funding um, and uh, fewer today. And, um, you know, I think people more, if, if they really get excited or passionate about something, they'll get behind it. But I think for titles like the Black Glove or, or Kickstarter projects like the Black Glove, when you don't have a known quantity, it's completely original. It's really hard to kickstart that because you, you really only have a 30 day window to kickstart it. And to, to build up awareness and, and get people to understand what you're trying to build and then fund that all within the span of 30 days is, is that's really challenging. Uh, you know, to some degree, we had a, a big advantage in that, you know, the known quantity of, of doing a new underworld. We had an existing fan base. Uh, but even, you know, there's the Descent game being done now, the new version of Descent and uh, uh you know, I know they're still working to get their minimum funding. It's it's not easy. Yeah, I noticed. I think you at some point I saw some stats on one of the updates, a, sort of a breakdown of who was supporting the Kickstarter. And this is just going from memory, but I wanted to say it was something like seventy percent were people that had played Ultima Underworld back in the day. Is that? Uh, it sounds right. If anything, it, I think it may have been a little higher than that. that. Wow. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's um, uh, you know, I think the people who who uh, back Kickstarters now for games um, are mostly people who are comfortable with Kickstarter have used it before. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's a fairly narrow slice of the, of the audience of gamers out there. In the, the Underworld, Underworld 1 and Underworld 2, uh, over a million copies of those games were sold uh, since it was released. Um, so when you think of the number of people who backed it, which is a little less than 14,000, 13,800 and change, it's a pretty small percentage of the people who bought the game. And then there were people who didn't buy it, but played the game, uh, either through friends or, you know, other methods. Uh, so, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of people who either weren't aware of the Kickstarter campaign, or if they were, they're just not comfortable with kick, you know, the concept of Kickstarters. Um, so it's a pretty narrow slice that actually participate in a Kickstarter. I was really, I really liked the blog post you did. 
I remember that. It, I guess it was in the midst of your Kickstarter when this, uh, these websites, uh, some of the sort of gaming press sites were coming out with this anti, almost an anti-Kickstarter uh, rant. I don't know what it was. They're basically trying to insinuate that all these projects were, were failing to materialize and a big scam. I mean, pretty preposterous. I mean, that must have been a terrible thing to see, like right in the middle of your uh, your Kickstarter campaign. Yeah, it was, uh, uh, and our PR firm was uh, was not thrilled with me wanting to speak out on it. I'm glad you <laughs> they, did. They, they suggested I just stay silent on it, but I didn't feel that was the right thing to do. I mean, it was it. Uh, I mean, I know I know nothing about you know the the, the project uh, that that was getting hammered on. I, I haven't been following that particular project, but but some of the press were really greatly enlarging on you know uh, uh, one projects or a few projects you know struggling. Uh, to, to get through development on Kickstarter and sort of generalizing and saying, you know, this is just uh, almost implying that all Kickstarter projects are going to, you know, are likely to fail or, uh, you know, way over promise what they're going to deliver. Um, and to me, what was the odd thing about that is that, you know, I've been in the games industry for a lot of years and there are tons of games that go through traditional, you know, game publishers that overpromise and fail to deliver or fail even to get done. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know what the statistics is, but there's a lot of projects that never make it, you know, through development and actually get delivered. Um, uh, now, it may be that gamers, uh, you know, fans aren't so aware of that, and they just assume if if a project gets started in development, it's going to get done and it's going to get, you know, meet all the expectations and be a great game. But I don't think there's anything unique about Kickstarting that, that says, well, Kickstarter games uh, are risky or, or, or overpromise, whereas non-Kickstarter games are all wonderful and come, you know, get delivered. Uh, so it just seemed like a, a broad brush. And, and you know, there's some great games that have been Kickstarted and delivered. Uh, you know, Wasteland, uh, you know, is, is quite a good game, Wasteland too, uh, And some other games that have come out. So... Uh, you know, I haven't, but some friends have. I need to play it, but I've heard good things Maybe about it. Maybe you should wait until after <laughs> you're done with it. Okay. Uh, it's a real, you it. know, you get in, totally into it. Uh, so I thought it was amazing. And I know Brian Fargo, I loved his his trailers or his pitch pitch videos. You know, we had that little kid on there, and he was uh, talking about how difficult it was to deal with publishers and all this stuff. And, you know, I was reading uh, the stuff about your Kickstarter and how you'd been trying to get electronic arts to, to do this project for a long time i assume you probably talked to other publishers too uh but they just seem to think there's just no market for this kind of game or nobody's interested in these properties anymore or something like that uh, do you think that's going to change now in the wake of all these kickstarter projects well i suspect that you know the success of some of these games um yes it's going to get uh, probably the traditional publishers to, to, to look at them more seriously, some of these old properties and, and bringing them back. Uh, but it, it's challenging in that it's not just about the property. It's about the teams. And, and ultimately, I think the teams are more important. You know, just taking something that was a classic game from 10 or 20 and throwing a team on it that doesn't necessarily, you know, understand it or hadn't worked on it or, Whatever, I, I don't think that's a recipe necessarily for success. So you think you, you you get fairly, you know, kind of unique combinations of uh, these teams who worked on these original titles who have a genuine passion for them and really want to bring them back. And and that's the case with what Fargo has put together, uh, or Chris Chris Roberts or Richard Garriott uh, and our own team, uh, where you know we've really wanted to bring this game back for basically since 1993. Uh, when we finished Underworld 2, our plan was to do an Underworld 3. We all thought we were. Um, but it didn't end up working that way. We, we had to take a 22-year, uh, a, a uh, you know, hiatus. <laughs> so. All right, well, I saw a clip from, this is uh, really exciting to me. I saw some uh, clips on the, on the side from Warren Spector. And he was talking on there about how the, uh, the, the new, uh, the Ascended game will have some big innovations in the realm of AI. You know, that's something I've, you know, really, I really was uh, excited to hear him say that because that's something I've really been uh, 
I've been wanting to see for a long time. You know, we we see we've got graphics that are amazing and all this kind of stuff, but I mean, I really mm -hmm. don't. You know, I don't see an equivalent sort of progression with the with the AI in games. So I was kind of wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on on that. You know, what's uh, is you know what what is the ult uh, Underworld Ascendant going to bring to the table in terms of AI that we haven't seen in other games? Um, well, de definitely AI were, was a cornerstone of the Looking Glass games and we were doing in the early days. Uh, you know, the original Underworld had for its time some pretty sophisticated AI uh, where the, the, the monsters weren't just there to, you know, charge at you and fight you, but they'd actually, you know, think about whether they wanted to attack you or not, uh, whether they, you know, decide to run away because they were being overmatched. Uh, whether, you know, they were trying to sneak up on you. So we had the beginnings of some of the AI that later in games like Thief, we went much further on stealth. But that all relied on some, some you know, for its error, very sophisticated AIs. Uh, because our underlying goal was to create a, 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 you know, responsive, reactive world where the player was an agent of sort of change and, and the world would respond to them. You know, our philosophy then and now is... We're trying to create a game world that feels like it would exist even if the player wasn't there and is ongoing. And the player is kind of tossed into this world and, uh, you know, permeates it and, and, and puts their own stamp on it. But that's because the world reacts to the player's choices and decisions and what they do. And the AI are a big part of that. I mean, there's mechanics and simulation and physics and other pieces that go into that. But the AI is where you know, the, the, the monsters and the NPCs kind of think about what the player's doing and, and make their own judgment calls of whether they like what the player is doing or, or you know, uh, agree or disagree or just how they react to it. Uh, so we want to go deeper with that with uh, Underworld Ascendant. And, you know, the, the computers we were working with in the early 90s and mid-90s were, you know, less powerful than the phone you, you probably have in your pocket. So... The ability to do sophisticated eyes was fairly constrained. You know, now we have an enormous amount of horsepower. You still have to be clever with AI. It's not easy to do, but it does make our job easier. So there's things that we can do uh, much more effectively and techniques that we can do that were just out of the realm uh, when we were doing those original games. So we think we can get AI that, that's, uh, and it's not about making it realistic. You know, this is a game. It's not about making the AI, you know, authentic, realistic. Uh, it's just making it interesting and react to the player. Uh, AI is a lot of smoke and mirrors. Uh, but, you know, when you when you have the AIs respond to the player in interesting and unpredictable ways, that's when fun yeah, gameplay happens. That's really, really cool. I'm really excited about that. Also, the I've been thinking about the improvisation engine of the original games and, you know, what, what we might expect to see. Uh, in the new ones, there's an example in one of the videos where there's a, some spiders across a bridge and the guy like uh, destroys the bridge mm -hmm. and, and it's really cool. And then you're, you're talking about how you, well, later, you know, you could mind control uh, uh, the, one of the spiders and ride back across there somehow and get to the right. treasure. And I'm like, okay, that is awesome. But, you know, how is it, I mean, how can you think of every possibility, right? I mean, I mean, I'm kind of imagining just hundreds well, of we don't. That, that, sort of possibilities, but you know, how would you procedure, how would you make, is there a word procedure rate? <laughs> you know, how would you make that a kind of a procedural right. generated thing? Oh, we don't, we don't script it. You, you, you couldn't script it all. And if you try to script it all, it would feel artificial. So we, we create, you know, it, it's more, it comes from a simulation background, of creating a dynamic system, set of systems uh, they all interact with each other. And, and you know, where sort of these systems work well is when you have multiple systems. Each system is not that complicated, but the way they interact with each other is, uh, you know, you get all the permutations, which become almost infinite if you have enough systems. If you had 20 systems that are all can each interact with each other in many, many ways, the permutations become immense. So, you know, we have a physics simulation and an AI simulation and ecology simulation and you know all these different elements uh interplay in ways that become very unpredictable so you know we're not really scripting anything we sort of set the world in motion and then the player 
walks into that world and starts doing things, casting magic, uh, approaching a creature, uh, whipping their sword and threatening the creature or battling the creature or, you know, uh, whatever they do, the world kind of reacts to that. And um, our litmus test, if that's working, is that there will be outcomes that we never expected. As designers, it's like, wow, didn't know you could do that. We hadn't, you know, thought that was even possible. Um, and so if we do our job right, the players will discover solutions um, and, and ways to resolve encounters that, you know, we're not up for. It can make testing hard. <laughs> it can make, it can, you know, you have to be careful about edge cases and, and things breaking. But, you know, if you can do that, then, then you have the freedom to let the players kind of really experiment. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with part two of my interview with Mr. Paul Newrath. A lot of great stuff, of course, and we'll start to delve into the history and some of the other games that he's worked on in the past. Uh, trust me, you're really going to want to stick around for that. It's some good stuff. As always, I want to thank you very, very, very much from the bottom of my heart, guys, if you have taken the time and trouble to support my efforts here at Matt Chat. If you would like to become a supporter, just go to the link in the show notes to a, a site called Patreon. It only takes a couple minutes and you can subscribe to Matt Chat. If you want to, if, if you think the show's worth a buck per episode, two bucks per episode, whatever you can afford and feel comfortable with, guys, I greatly, greatly appreciate that. So thank you very much for that. All right, what about the news from the Matt Cave? All right, so quite a bit of news here, uh, as usual, a mix of good and bad. Uh, kind of a bit of a personal news, I guess, to start off with. As you probably know, I am one of the producers of a documentary, a feature film documentary called Gameplay, the story of the video game revolution. It's a really, really good film. It was uh, done with uh, Luke's Digital Pictures. They've got professional quality uh, 3D animation in there and all kinds of really cool stuff, interviews uh, with people like John Romero, uh, David Crane, uh, Nolan Bushnell even. Uh, it's really, really a great, I mean, I'm really, really proud of this uh, documentary. Unfortunately, it's been a bit tricky to uh, figure out how to view this, especially if you live outside of the United States. I put together a blog post. I'm trying to collect all the various uh, ways that I know of that I've heard about so far. Uh, I know Vimeo on demand is one, uh, net, uh, not Netflix yet, uh, iTunes, Amazon, Instant, and then several other choices, uh, console, uh, video players, and so on and so forth. Uh, anyway, I will post a link to that uh, blog post, uh, so hopefully you can go check that out. It's not, not expensive. Uh, I think it's most of them about 4 or $5, and you can uh, own this thing and watch it, and I think you'll really, really enjoy that. So uh, just take a look in the show notes. All right, let's see. What else do I have here? Uh, Mike Mitchell wrote in, and these are kind of last minute. Uh, hopefully uh, you guys uh, won't, won't wait too long to watch the video. You'll miss out on these. Uh, the first one is a Humble Bundle 2, I think what they're calling this. If, if you don't know about Humble Bundle, they basically it's a bunch of great uh, games, usually a mix of indies and commercial, uh, or like mainstream games, sometimes older games. Uh, but anyway, they're usually pretty good, uh, pretty good bundles, and it's kind of like Match Hatch. You know, you pay whatever you think uh, the bundle's worth, and I, you know, a chunk of it, it's, it's all for charity, uh, right? So... Uh, it goes for a good cause to boot, so it's it's a really good thing. I've always a, I think I probably bought about every single one. Uh, this one has Ultima Seven, Mass Effect Two, uh, both of those uh, the first two Dragon Ages, uh, Peggle I believe, and much much more in this. I think it's got Wing Commander in there. I kind of I mean it's just it's just a no brainer really. Uh, so go over there. I put a link to that. Unfortunately, I think the I think it's over tomorrow. So unless you <laughs> are an early bird viewer, you probably miss out on that. Uh, but, you know, even if you do miss miss this one, uh, you can sign up for the Humble Bundle newsletter and you'll get uh, notified when they have new bundles. Uh, another bit of news, the game Convoy uh, debuted the, on the 21st. Uh, this is a roguelike uh, FTL, sort of meets Mad Max, meets Auto Duel type of thing. Uh, I have played it. I enjoyed it 
to a certain degree. Let me say, I really, really like the game itself, but the they kind of went in that FDL direction with the super, super hard uh, final fight, the end boss. Just, whew. <laughs> you know, I was never able to beat FTL no matter how many times I tried. And it looks like this convoy is the same kind of thing. And I just... You know, it just bugs me when I can't finish a game on my own without having to uh, look at cheats and that sort of thing. So, uh, it is what it is. If that doesn't bother you, then, buy, you know, I highly recommend it. Uh, that's really my only uh, gripe about it. And, and that's on easy mode, too, by the way. So, I can't even imagine what, what it must be like on <laughs> normal or hard. Uh, okay. Uh, also, speaking of roguelikes, uh, Steam has a sell-up right now on roguelike games. Uh, lots of really great specials. Unfortunately, again, I think it's over tomorrow night, so you might have a little more chance to grab that. Uh, they got some really good games on there. Uh, I picked up a lot of these roguelikes I had on my wish list forever, like uh, Desktop desktop Dungeons. I'm having a lot of fun with that right now. Uh, there's a game called Infested Planet. Uh, it looks pretty cool. Played a little bit of that. Uh, several other games. Uh, you know, I've, I happen to have most of them in, in my library already, but uh, if you haven't really explored the roguelike genre, now would be a really great time to head on over there and uh, pick a few of those titles up. Uh, lots of great stuff. And good thing about a roguelike is it's pretty much infinite replay value. So, All right, so the final bit of news here, uh, Bethesda and Valve have worked out a deal where they will be selling mods uh, for Skyrim. So as you know, there's a pretty huge uh, modding scene for that game. And apparently now those uh, creators of those mods will actually be able to sell those mods and get a cut. Uh, and I haven't done a lot of research into this. I don't know all the exact details of the arrangement, but uh, basically it looks like you know people have been getting the mods for free, and now at least some of them uh, will be sold. You don't have to buy those, and <laughs> they'll have all the usual uh, caveats in there about not sharing those, you know, and, uh, and all that. Anyway, apparently it has uh, touched off a bit of a firestorm in the modding community. And I have to admit, I'm not, you know, I'm not a modder. I don't make mods, and I haven't ever <laughs> really installed very many. I think I might have installed a couple for older games. Uh, so I don't really know what all this, uh, what all the fuss is about. Uh, so I was hoping you guys could kind of bring me up to speed on that, educate me a little bit. Uh, so if you know a lot, of, if you if you know what's going on, or if you're into this modding scene, and you know what the controversy is all about, uh, sound off in the show notes, and I'll be sure to read those. And, and thank you for uh, for helping keep me up to up to date on that. So I really don't quite understand what the what the uh, the fuss is about. All right, I think that will do it for the news. Uh, now, what about that ale of the week? Uh, this week, I've got a little little number here called the Hop Happy India Pale Ale. Uh, this is brewed uh, in Milwaukee, mkebrewing.com. Uh, they give you instructions here on how to drink a beer. <laughs> you know, if you need instructions to drink a beer... Let's see. Brewed with three different kinds of hops, this IPA is balanced by the oats added to the mash. The oats not only add an unexpected sweetness, but also a heavier mouthfeel. Mouthfeel. I don't really like the word mouthfeel. Uh, let's see, anything else here? Usually they'll at least tell you how much uh, alcohol. Oh, there we go. Uh, so 7.5% alcohol by volume, so not too bad. You know, that's about where I like it. You know, I consider that to be about a medium, medium high uh, these days. Uh, anything above 8%, you know, you're really getting into some strong stuff. And I don't like to go below 5 because uh, then you're just, <laughs> you're just drinking water at that point. Uh, so this one seems in, in to be, maybe this is kind of in a sweet spot here. We'll see. Anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Hop Happy India Pale Ale here in the rather excellent drinking horn. <sighs> got a really really good aroma to it kind of a what is that kind of a little you can definitely smell the hops in here a little bit of a chocolatey coffee like aroma definitely what I would expect a good IPA to smell like a little bit of kind of a peachy citrusy kind of thing there uh, in the aroma as well uh, but let's give it a taste ah uh, that mouth feel <laughs> Mouthfeel. Yeah. Uh, Taste-wise, this is definitely uh, pungent. Uh, it's got sort of a chocolatey peanut kind of flavor to it. Let me try it again here. 
definitely a bit on the uh, creamier side. I like I got uh, beer foam all in my mustache and the old flavor saver. Uh, it tastes pretty good. What do we got there? Kind of the grape nuts, uh, what I call a little grape nuts flavor. Um, it's kind of a, a, bit, a bit sweet uh, towards the end. Uh, definitely getting kind of a, uh, what is that, a bit of a cherry-like flavor there. Uh, the alcohol-wise, it's not really overpowering. You know, 7.5, sometimes you get something that, <laughs> you know, the fumes are coming off of it. But uh, this is actually quite nice, quite drinkable. Uh, I'll try it one more time here. Actually, uh, quite liking this. Um, very comp uh, complex flavor uh, going down. Not quite sure what to make of the whole mouthfeel thing, but it's uh, actually quite nice. You know, you could sip this over the course of uh, an hour or two and, uh, you know, have a good, a good old time with it. So lots of uh, stuff going on with the flavor to keep you uh, interested in this. Uh, I'm actually really liking this. I'm going to try it one more time before I give it a, a ranking. It's just kind of hard to uh, find anything to complain about. It's a little bit, just a little bit bitter. Um, but, you know, that's what you would expect with an IPA, so that's not a criticism. You know, I don't know. I'm going to have to go, I guess, a full five out of five of drinking horns on this. It's, uh, especially if you like IPAs, I don't see how you go wrong with this. Uh, very good flavors on this. All the, uh, a lot of complexity. It's interesting and uh, it's not overpowering, uh, but also, you know, quite uh, a lot of taste there to uh, keep you occupied. So a uh, full five out of five horns on the Hop Happy India Pale Ale. These guys have done a good job. So for the quotation, I, I was looking for things about the underworld. Of course, I came across some from Dante. Of course, no, no <laughs> big shocker there. He wrote the, the Inferno, one of the great works of uh, world literature. Anyway, I thought this uh, quotation from Dante worked pretty well for this, uh, this episode. And it's got sort of a uh, a nice little, uh, uh, what's the word, connection, I guess. Anyway, it goes something like this. Consider your origins. You are not made to live as brutes, but to follow virtue and knowledge. See you guys next week. Uh, doctor, that was quite a bombshell you laid on us last night at the end of the show. And, uh, could you uh, tell us a little bit about what you were talking about? Yes, well, we've been doing about two years of research involving the carcinogenic properties of uh, various synthetic fabrics, double knits, and polyesters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, we have a lot of laymen here tonight, and, uh, <laughs> for sure. And uh, what is that exactly in layman's terms? Well, very simply stated, it means that uh, leisure suits cause cancer. <laughs>